Well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Welcome to the Finance and Economic Development Committee uh, for the 5th of April, 2022. <coughs> Bienvenue à la Comité des Finances et de Développement Économique pour le 5 avril 2022. Uh, do we have quorum, Madam Coordinator? Yes, we do, Mr. Mayor. And I think everyone knows the, the rules in terms of uh, Zoom, so we don't have to go over those. So we'll do a quick roll call. Councillor Cloutier. Yeah. Councillor Curry. Here. Councillor DeRuz. Here, Mr. Mayor. Councillor El Shantiri. Present. Councillor Gower. Here. Councillor Hubley. Councillor Hubley. Uh, Councillor Luloff. Je suis présent. Councillor Moffat. Here. Councillor Tierney. I know he was having computer problems, so he'll be a little, a little long. Uh, Vice Chair Dudas. Or there, okay. Uh, declarations of interest, declaration d'intérêt. Uh, confirmation of minutes, adoption de process verbal for the uh, March, the 1st of March, 2022. Carried. Uh, communications uh, as uh, presented, postponements and deferrals, land exchange of 529 Tremblay Road and 530 Tremblay Road with Her Majesty the Queen and Right of Canada. And Councillor Cloutier, if there was uh, a deferral motion, if you'd like to introduce it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Merci. Uh, where is the report as um that we're dealing with was deferred from the March 1st, 2022 meeting of Finance and Economic Development Committee to provide additional time to review the Memorandum of Agreement with the Public Service Procurement Canada and Canada Lands Company. And whereas staff are requesting additional time to continue to review the latter matter, therefore be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee defer this item back to the Director of Corporate Real Estate Office for resubmission when further information is available. Okay, uh, on the motion, carried. Carried. Okay, okay we'll go through the uh, consent agenda. Uh, item two, disposition of 2021 uh, tax and rate supported operating surplus deficit. Carried. Oh, hold, please. Sorry, who asked for that? Councillor Menard, thanks, uh, Mayor. Come back to that. <laughs> um, budgets and special levies for business improvement areas in Spark Street Mall Authority. Carry. Okay. Okay. Uh, item four: 2022 tax ratios and other tax policies. Annual requirement. Carried. Okay. Carried. 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 Uh, innovative uh, Client Services, um, Comprehensive Legal Services Report for the period July 1st to December 31st, 2021. Received? Received. Received. Uh, Office of the City Clerk, City Representation and Delegate Attendance at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Association of Municipalities of Ontario Annual Conferences. Carried? Yeah. Carried. Great. Uh, planning, infrastructure, and economic development, delegation of authority, acquisition, and sale of land and property, July 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2021. Received? Received. Uh, Montreal Road uh, CIP, we have uh, some delegations, so we'll come back to that. Uh, infrastructure and Water Services Department, Comprehensive Asset Management Program, Core Asset Management Plans. Hold, please. Well, who is that, Eli? Yes. Um, and then we have uh, other business, an item to be waived on. Uh, Councillor Dudas, um, this is uh, time sensitive uh, with respect to the operation of RCGT Park because the baseball season is about to begin. On suspension of the rules, Karen. Uh, so, Councillor Dudas, we'll come back to yours because uh, we have some delegations at, at another item. So, uh, back to that one that uh, I know is in Councillor King's uh, ward. So, our uh, first item that has um, members of the public, we'll get to them first, is uh, item eight Montreal Road Community Improvement Plan. 
Um, we have the applicant, uh, no need to speak, um, Emily uh, Rukian, unless uh, held for questions. So if there are any questions, we'll come back to you. So speaking uh, on, on this item, Chris Greenshield, Vice President, Vanier Community Association. Is uh, Chris Greenshield's with us? I don't think we see Chris, so maybe we'll just uh, come back uh, to him or her. Uh, Natalie <coughs> Carey. Uh, Natalie thank Carey. you, Mr. Mayor. I'm now connected. Oh, okay. This is Chris Greenshields. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, the floor is yours for five minutes. Uh, thank you. And let me just get myself. Yeah, the Vanier Community Association uh, supports this application for a CIP uh, grant for two Montreal Road and uh, three Selkirk. Uh, this is an important project for Vanier, situated uh, at its uh, West Gateway. It is one of a series of uh, development projects in Vanier's uh, western sector, expected to create uh, 3,200 residential uh, rental units in the next few years. Vanier has a population of about 18,000, and about 70% of the households are renters. These projects, together with the many more both big and small developments, especially in our predominant R4 zone, will contribute to the growth and renewal of Banyu's housing stock and to its commercial and employment revitalization. The so-called missing middle is not missing in Vanier, but given Vanier's high level of intensification, both existing and future, we need parks, recreation, and other community facilities similar to other neighborhoods in the city's urban uh, transit. Something that a Vanier secondary plan, as well as the current review of the parkland dedication bylaw need to address. Similarly, we need more affordable housing. Increasing supply may help address concerns about the increase of rents. The VCA had earlier been given to hope that the this CIP grant would take up the important provision of the Montreal Road CIP to address affordable housing. The staff report does not really take up this and we recognize that the mixed use uh, phase one will include a substantial replacement of the existing uh, commercial space of the Eastview uh, Plaza while adding uh, residential units. This will serve Vanier's commercial revitalization the goal of the Montreal Road Revitalization Project nearing completion, and of course, another purpose of the Montreal Road uh, CIP. The other major redevelopment, one called Montreal Road, which is to provide up to 900 rental units, has special provisions for affordable housing. Similarly, we hope that any further CIP application for phase two of this project will address the provision of more affordable housing. We look forward to continuing to work with Equiton, Maine and Maine uh, as the latest reiteration of site plan control for phase one gets underway. Thank you, Messi. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Greenshields. Anyone have a question to the delegation? So next is Natalie Carrier, Executive Director, Vanier BIA. Bonjour, Natalie. Welcome. Bonjour. Bienvenue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, committee members, and thanks for giving us the opportunity to address you today. The Vanya BIA supports the CIP program and in particular the application before you today at Maine and Maine, who will be developing two Montreal Road and 29 Selkirk into three towers of much needed rental housing and modern retail spaces. The CIP program, as you know, is an applicant self-funded program, meaning that it's directly correlated to the investment made by the applicant. In this case, in phase one, um, that represents $89 million in investments within a project of over $300 million total investment in Vanier. As per other CIP, no funds from the current city treasury would be utilized for this grant as it is essentially a freeze on commercial property taxes following a substantial improvement of a property within uh, the Montreal Road CIP project, uh, sorry, revitalization project. Once built, the current property taxes of $212,000 annually paid to the city for Eastview Plaza would go up to an estimated $1.6 million annually as revenue to the city. 
The CIP allows um, them a 75% discount on that uplift for 10 years, a sum that has been estimated in its case at $5 million. It should be noted by this committee that like all other developers, this applicant has already given almost $6 million in fees and permits to the city before a single shovel has hit the ground. Maine and Maine have been working very closely with the BIA and the Community Association from the onset of their investment on our Main Street. They have allocated time and funds to ensure all current retail tenants were relocated within the BIA, including several racialized businesses. They have worked collaboratively uh, with us on the public art gateway project feature, um, ensuring that their property and the city's property, which you may know are sort of join, um, are, are going to be managed by the BIA and that that project will be seamless and that the gateway art piece itself could be integrated into their current construction project saving costs. They have listened to the community concerns about safety, affordability, and of course design and have addressed those concerns in a forthcoming and positive way. <clears throat> Maine and Maine believe in Vanier. Their proposed development is a modern is modern and beautiful. They have taken the time to research the community and the environments and have reflected our uniqueness in their designs. They will be creating up to 250 full-time jobs through this retail through retail spaces and 30 other jobs of their own complex management staff. Um, they will be bringing 1,500 new residents to Vanya. These residents will support community initiatives, participate in our activities, and of course, work, shop, and dine on our main streets. This is the second application for the Montreal CIP. We are expecting more to come and we'll encourage you to support them too. Some are commercial use improvements. Others are well-needed multi-use commercial and housing developments like this one. All these investments are well needed on Montreal Road. The Vanier BIA faces important economic development with physical renewal challenges. Many of our buildings like the EZU Plaza are iconic, but also archaic uses of spaces with large surface parking lots, unusable retail spaces, renovation costs beyond what could be managed by most new businesses. As I've said to this committee before, there is a demand by business to settle into Vanier. However, even though we have vacancy on Montreal Road, much of that vacancy is not rentable. We need precisely these kinds of investments along the corridor and we need the city to support them so we can actually welcome the small businesses who, who like us see the potential in Vanier. Developments like the proposed Main and Main project will offer 20,000 square foot of bright new commercial spaces, the possibilities for patios, fun restaurants, and little shops. Main and Main understands the needs of the changing retail landscape, and they are a bright, very bright beacon for our BIA and our community. It is a sign that the venue we have invested in, the venue that residents know, is beginning to grow and radiate and shine brightly. Investors like Main and Main are needed and welcome the venue. <clears throat> encourage you to support this application. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions for Natalie? No? Okay, thank you very much. Very thank thorough you. presentation. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, on the report? Carried? Carried. Uh, Carried. Carried. Uh, the next item that was held is item um, number two, disposition of tax and rate supported operating uh, surplus deficit. Um, Councillor Menard, you had a question? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Can you hear me okay uh, right now? Yep. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to uh, just raise a couple of questions about this just so I, I uh, understand a little bit better. Um, the, uh, there are several items I wanted to touch on. One is the, the housing reserve. So I, I see that um, some of those funds are going back um, into the reserve, the 7.5 million out of the about 15 million that was uh, that was a surplus as a result of the other portion being mostly due uh, to COVID related um, uh, savings um, or I guess other government transfers that helped us in that regard. <clears throat> um, that 7.5 million, there's a, uh, there's a referenced bylaw around it. And I'm just wondering to staff um, you know, what the possibility is to, to reinvest that funding into needed capital expenditures around affordable housing uh, on the 7.5 million uh, portion. Wendy, I think. Uh... Uh, thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll start and, and my colleague, uh, uh, Ms. Gray may want to um, just add to my answer, but Councillor, you're correct. Um, 
7.5 million, which is the surplus from housing, is required to go back to that housing reserve. So we do that right off the top in terms of the overall um, surplus that we have from last year. So that money uh, is sitting in the reserve and is available to be reinvested in housing projects. And what I'll do is I'll just pass it over to my colleague, Donna, who may be able to expand in terms of um, uh, the actual reserve usage. And I think maybe also just reference the 13.6 million that CPS um, dealt with that would uh, go into keeping the respite centers open. Is that? Yeah, that thank correct? you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's um, a change since the disposition report uh, was tabled and released. So at CPS committee last week, uh, there was a report that went forward in terms of an investment in the continuation of the respite centers and the physical distancing centers, as well as a plan in terms of looking forward for that. Uh, and the committee approved that report and an investment of $13.6 million. And what we've done is um, we've set aside or allocated 13.6 million from the tax stabilization reserve to be able to fund that uh, and that's really um, we're waiting on the commitment um, from the provincial government with respect to any additional social services relief fund money that we may receive but we don't know that as of yet so we've tagged that money um, to be able to cover that cost. Great Donna. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and so council's working within the approved long range financial plan. And so each year that capital investment, there's a capital plan that gets presented to planning committee that talks about those expenditures and that plan, that report will be coming to the planning uh, committee in the spring of this year. Um, that's in addition to what we've already put out in 2020 and 2021 with the support of other levels of government in the amount of 108 million. And we're also right now looking at working, we've been working with the federal and provincial government looking at both the housing accelerator uh, fund and the rapid housing initiative. So we are anticipating that those programs will be launching and those will be included as the other levels of governments uh, investments to support council's investment in the long range financial plan. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's helpful background information. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple other subjects just very quickly. Um, the, um, the auto police service uh, deficit is one that is being uh, funded uh, from um, what appears to be a, a loan. And I just wanted to maybe get clarity on this. Um, the report talks about that OPS will uh, self-fund the deficit uh, through refinancing cap the capital project South facility. Um, with debt and returning reserve funding to the OPS general reserve. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, are, are we the creditor in this case? Um, is the city providing financial relief in that case? I, I saw John Willing's report um, that the city is covering the 5.2 million by allowing the, the, the police service to borrow 9 million from the city uh, for the new South End police station instead of using the money already in the in the police reserve. So I just, is that an accurate description? And, and if not, can, can just staff explain this um, uh, more accurately? Yeah, thanks, Councillor, for the question and the opportunity to explain this because it's it is a tad bit complicated. Um, what we have done is we've worked uh, with OPS in terms of their deficit, and uh, they are covering the five million of the deficit through their reserve funds. And those funds, um, as you know, uh, the capital portion for police is funded through their own budget. The city does not provide any funding for that. So they're covering those pieces. And then they're also looking forward to say um, for that particular project, if they need to, then they'll issue additional debt, which will be covered through their budget. So it's not the city that's covering off that piece whatsoever. The police are taking care of that. The other nuance here is uh, the $2.8 million which is the remainder of the deficit, which is really city driven. So our remissions, our tax remissions were greater than usual uh, than what we had forecasted and budgeted for in 2021. And that is, it's basically our responsibility and we're covering that off through the tax stabilization reserve as would we do for any other area of the city. So there's two very distinct portions of it. One is OPS driven, they are covering that off within their own budget. Budget, 
And the second is really driven by the city and we are covering that off through tax stabilization. Okay. And, and what is left in the in the OPS reserve? Um, I see, you know, we're reallocating five million back to it, but what's what's there uh, now? I'll get that for you. I don't have that number in front of me. Okay. Okay. I just recognize, you know, again, taxpayers would be covering off the additional amount, um, the uh, the extra two and a, some million. Uh, and it'd be helpful to know how much, you know, before council, how much um, is actually in that reserve separate to that. So thank you. Uh, the last question I have is around um, a motion that we passed last budget uh, around um, the close out of the uh, the year. And I know uh, 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 Ms. Stephenson, we've talked about this uh, as well before. So thank you for that. Um, it, it, that was the 1 million for um, uh, retrofits to buildings and the revolving fund that we were trying to get started uh, within um, environment climate change uh, initiatives. And so can you just speak to that one piece uh, in terms of the, the surplus? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, that piece will come before FedCo in June. So that's when we uh, have our report that will come forward with respect to the capital close exercise. So this is our operating portion of the budget. The pieces uh, and the request that was made uh, was around a capital mm -hmm. investment that we need um, to make with respect to climate change. So we will bring that back to you in June. And um, that's where uh, you will see uh, the disposition of the uh, all the capital that has happened, the review of the capital accounts, uh, where we can close those that are finished, uh, where we may have to reallocate some of those monies. And uh, that's where we bring back the recommendation with respect to that investment. Okay. Thank you very much for this. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Just, uh, just to clarify, Ms. Stevenson, the city by law, Ontario law is required to cover any deficit of the police. Is that correct? Yes, it flows through to the city. Correct. Okay. Uh, Councillor Egline. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a quick question. So um, we've got surpluses that we're shifting around. Some is going into reserves. Some is is, is um, being used to, to plug holes in other departments or other budgets. So I guess my question is this. Is this final? What I mean by that is, are any of the things that we're trying to plug, trying to fix with the, with the uh, surplus money still related to COVID? And is it possible we may still get additional funding uh, from other levels of government. And if that does happen, to fill in those those holes, so to speak, what happens to the money that we're voting on today to transfer in, if you follow me? Thanks, Councillor, uh, for the question. This is the final disposition for 2021 based on all the information that we have, all of the grants that we've received uh, from other levels of government. Uh, there is one piece that is outstanding, uh, and that is some funding we're expecting for paramedics. We have no written confirmation as of yet in terms of that allocation, so that will flow into 2022. But this is 21, and it closes the book, so there'll be no change with respect to 2021. So any COVID money we were expecting from the other levels of government for that calendar year is, we're satisfied there's nothing more coming. It's noted and received, yes. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Just uh, on the paramedic issue, I received a letter yesterday uh, and it was CC'd to the city manager on uh, new funding for the paramedics from the province. So we might want to just check uh, before council to see if that um, is, was, expected to deal with a go forward basis or if it was retroactive I, I can't recall from from the letter but uh, it just happened to come into my office yesterday so we'll take a look at that through Steve K. Uh, Councillor Gower please. Thanks Mayor. Um, committee received a letter yesterday from GOBA about the surplus uh, just over 8.7 million in planning real estate and economic development uh, from excess user fees and um, in the letter, they stated that redirecting these funds into a general city account would be against the Planning Act because the fees were supposed to go specifically towards addressing planning applications. I was wondering if uh, Mr. Willis could address uh, where that surplus comes from or, and uh, well, I guess address the comments from GOBA in that letter. Good morning, Steve. Morning, Mr. Mayor and members of the committee. For just breaking down the department's surplus for last year, it's about an $8.7 million surplus. And if I 
and some of that's from cost savings and some of it's from additional revenues. The about 1.1 million of it is building code uh, related additional fees and that does go into a dedicated building code reserve and it stays within the building code service. And in any given year, depending on applications being up or down, uh, that reserve is used to balance things out over time and we only adjust fees when that, uh, when that isn't occurring. So that money is staying within the building code uh, area. Other fees in other areas, such as in right of way, the the road permit fees and road cuts and road real you know elements related to the road activity bylaw are not subject to the planning act and not applicable. So the two point seven million dollars city that is the city's monies to do with as it wishes, and and it's actually part of the plan to earn money to reinvest in our management of our right of way. That's actually intended. So the only portion of the fees that Goba's case uh, letter really refers to is two point seven million dollars in additional revenue. And at the beginning of any budget year, it's almost impossible to project how many applications we're going to get. There are cycles in this that are up and down in any given year. Uh, last year is a particularly unusual year in that, you know, we're adopting a new official plan and a whole bunch of applications come in to take advantage of the old official plan before the new rules come in. So it creates a spike in revenue. There's also typically in the third year of a term of council, a spike in applications because applicants want their applications dealt with before the end of the term of council and the, the blackout period of having committee and council to actually approve anything. So it's not unusual to see a bit of a spike in the third year. So it's really impossible for the treasurer or the department to project whether whether we're going to hit or you know exceed the revenue targets. And, and the treasurer and I are looking at the fee structure to see whether or not um, what we're going to do on a go forward basis and whether or not there's some additional resources we can deploy back. Uh, maybe our fees would actually allow us to enhance some resources we already have, but we're going to look at that on a go forward basis. Um, so this is work we're actually doing and, and and we're also developing a memo to council right now as we speak on the impact of Bill 109, which will have very substantial implications on the department. So I would not project with the changes in Bill 109 that we would have re, uh, surpluses in future years without massive changes to our process. So that was going to be my next question. Uh, we're, we're one quarter into 2022. What is being done this year to ensure that those fees are invested in staffing and resources so that we don't see such a large surplus coming out of 2022? Just, just to be perfectly clear, in 2021, there were no positions left unfilled deliberately. Um, any gapping dollars we have, which were a very minor component of that surplus, were just as a result of the natural vacancy that occurs between a position becoming vacant and someone reoccupying the position. Uh, so there, is, there was no deliberate intention to hold back on hiring in 2021. I can assure committee, uh, committee that. Uh, in terms of 2022, we have a number of term positions and some strategic opportunities to perhaps look at our revenues coming in to deploy them in tactical improvements on service and the treasurer and I are working on that as we speak. Okay, thank you, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you, uh, Councillor Gower. Uh, Conseil Fleury. Bonjour, merci, Monsieur le maire. Um, my question, uh, Wendy, is on the report. It, it's, uh, it, it's, I understand why we have to write it, but I'm, I'm curious why it didn't mention where we're at uh, now that first quarter of 22 is completed, could you maybe give us a bit of an outlook of shortfalls or deficits so far in, in 22? Uh, thanks, Councillor, for the question. This report covers the disposition for 21 year end. Uh, it does not provide that look forward as of yet for Q1. Uh, we are literally just closing our, our first quarter of Q1, and we will bring a report forward, uh, I believe, in June um, at FEDCO with respect to where we're at. So we'll provide that that look forward in terms of what, what has actually happened during the first quarter um, and hopefully a bit of a look forward. So I don't have that for you today, my apologies, uh, but it will come forward to council. Would it be possible to get, because uh, we're allocating parts here, we're deciding where parts of the surplus are going and not, uh, not seeing in real time or in close to real time where our new emerging pressures are, uh, you know, uh, kind of leave, leaves a, a, uh, an interesting flank. So I wonder, is there something that can be shared ahead of council to give a bit of understanding uh, as to how those, uh, the, the funding buckets that are identified in this surplus uh, were selected, understanding where we're at in, uh, in 2022 um, revenues? Uh, 
I just, uh, Councillor, I just think that would be somewhat impossible task for our staff because they're just closing out the first quarter. And as you know, every, every bill doesn't come in when scheduled. Uh, this is really a look back on the, the full fiscal year of 2021. So I'm not sure, um, Wendy, in terms of having staff uh, cobble together a report that is going to be uh, not exactly accurate uh, because, um, you know, if there was uh, one, one extra bad snowstorm, it puts the number out of whack, for instance. You have to wait till the end of the year. But Wendy, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. It, it is difficult for us at this point in time to have that view forward um, in terms of what it's going to look like to the end of the year. I, what I can do, Councillor, is I can certainly prepare something that speaks to the disposition, which we have done in the report, but I can um, prepare something that is rather, I'm going to say short form, that talks about where all the funds are going. And the funds are directed in this report in terms of the policies and bylaws that we have in place, of which our council approved. So where, where there is a surplus, and I, I speak to sort of the boards and commissions with respect to what the city have has overall responsibility for monies go back to those particular boards and commissions so take transit as an example the transit surplus goes back to transit we have a bylaw in place that basically states any housing surplus goes back to housing we look at um, the ottawa public library any surplus goes back to the library reserve. In addition to that, council has made a commitment in terms of the central library. And we know a portion of that surplus will be funding uh, the central library project. So it, it's, it, these things are not, uh, these decisions are not made uh, in terms of how we think they should go. It's based on our policies and our bylaws that we have in place with respect to the direction of the funds. Well, I think okay. the other thing is though, it's gonna be, it's going to be an anomaly the first quarter because that was when the convoy uh, took place and we're still uh, counting on the federal and provincial governments for providing $36 million to cover the police and city costs. So I'm not sure you get an accurate uh, thumbnail sketch of exactly how the year is going to go based on the first quarter because we had those extraordinary costs and I have full confidence that the federal and provincial governments will pay the full amount um, of uh, overtime and, and extraordinary costs for police mostly police and, and some city services. No, I appreciate, uh, appreciate the context and, and thank you, Mr. Mayor and Wendy. Um, just maybe on, on more specific items there. So uh, we're showing an almost $6 million deficit for the PILT. It's one of the, the paragraphs that you've, uh, that, that is in the report. Um, we've seen public, um, public discussions of that or public articles of that. I, I wonder if you could comment on uh, the conversations that are happening, particularly with federal agencies, and if that is a risk beyond last year. Maybe I can offer a comment from the political perspective, Wendy, and then you could offer from the public servant point of view. Uh, I, I had a uh, phone call with the, the new minister in charge of PILTS uh, and brought forward a number of recommendations in how they can help us without... Um, uh, affecting dramatically the bottom line of the federal government. And we're still waiting on a reply to that proposal that we sent uh, the minister a couple of weeks ago. So we continue to negotiate and raise uh, the issues at the political level. I, I hosted a meeting of the local government caucus, uh, I think two weeks ago, and that was one of the items on the agenda. And uh, we're continuing our effort to uh, recoup those dollars. These, these are the dollars that were lost as a result of the province bringing in a reduction to the, the uh, education tax and then that and had the um, unfortunate uh, circumstance of affecting our bottom line while they were trying to help the small business community. So it's, it's really at the doorstep of the federal government. Wendy? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I think you've spoken to the issue quite well. Uh, we're having similar conversations at the staff level uh, as to the mayor has been having with his colleagues at the federal level. We've also included the province in our discussion. So really, I'm going to say a tri-party uh, conversation. And we have taken those same solutions and put them in front of staff. And it's an ongoing conversation to try and find a solution that works best for all parties. And uh, the issue here is it's a bit of an anomaly for Ottawa, and I say that because of the number of federal properties that we have in our city, but it does affect properties across Ontario. So we're trying to find something that will work for all municipalities in Ontario in terms of a solution. Okay, okay. 
uh, thank you. Thank you for to both of you for that. Um, so on the housing piece, so on page seven of the report, we're bringing, we're returning 7.5 million into the housing reserves. Is that, is it possible to get in a, where we're at with that reserve account? Like what's the status of that account? The general housing reserve is covered off in, I think it's document uh, three, Councillor, uh, and the balance, uh, the projected balance at year end is $8.5 million. And just remember, this is the general reserve. This is not the specific capital accounts related to the projects that are underway. Okay, so that, that leads me to my, my next point here. So would we, if council, so as per the bylaw elements that you were raising before, uh, could we assign, I'd like to assign way more, but 7.5 right now is just going into the housing reserve. My, my belief is that we should be spending more money in capital, so in new housing options. So if, if council wanted to signify that, would it have to be even more specific on the, on the selection of the account? I'm just looking for clarity on what does the bylaw state in that regards and what would be council's authority in, in, in that? I'm going to give you a very long explanation here, Councillor, um, in terms of your question. Uh, first, uh, the bylaw is specific in terms of the housing surplus being returned to the housing reserve. So that's why you see the $7.5 million going to the housing reserve. But I'm, at, I'm going to start actually at the top and I'm going to start with the larger surplus and sort of work my way through that so you understand the allocations that have been made and sort of what the city is has left at the end of the day, because I think this is important and very germane to the question that you have asked. So the larger surplus for the city, as we know, for all boards commissions, the city tax supported and the city rate supported budgets is $52 million. And then we have to take that $52 million and we have to carve that out in terms of which budget those go to and which budgets they support, right? Because we have separate budgets for transit. We have a separate self-funded budget through rate. Uh, we have our tax supported budget. And then we have the various policies and bylaws that say where those surpluses must go back to. So we start with transit. We know they have a $15 million surplus and that will go back to the transit operating reserve. And that's actually critical at this point in time because we've got a number of issues that we're facing in transit around the funding of the public inquiry, the audit of the LRT. Um, we know we're getting some funding to help us with 2022, but again, we don't know what that allocation is and we may have a gap to fill for 2022. So those monies go back to the transit reserve. And then we've allocated 7.5 million to go um, to the housing reserve in accordance with the bylaw that we have in place. Then we look at uh, approximately $4.5 million, which is directed to the solid waste reserve in accordance with the bylaw that we have in place. Um, and that's uh, the, that reserve is actually in deficit. So we need to bring that up to uh, as close to break even and into a positive state. So those monies are being directed there in accordance with the bylaw that we have. And we have $5.2 million from a library surplus. Um, and that's outside of our tax supported budget. And that surplus is being returned to the library reserve. And through council report, uh, with respect to the central library project, we have committed $4 million to that um, to cover a portion of uh, the build for the project and the rest goes to their general reserves. And then we return to the rate reserve. We've got approximately, I think it's $4.5 million in terms of the surplus. That's a separately funded budget. And so those monies go back to the waste, uh, the wastewater and the stormwater reserves appropriately. So we don't mix those. I spoke about uh, police services in terms of what we're dealing with um, there. Uh, they're covering off a portion of their budget through their own reserves. And we're covering off approximately 2.8 um, because of the increased tax remissions. So that leaves us with approximately $20 million, which is being recommended to go to the tax stabilization reserve. And then what we need to remember 
is the report that came forward last week through Community and Protective Services in terms of the investment that we want to make in the respite centers and the physical distancing centers. And we basically um, tagged or allocated 13.6 of this uh, to cover the costs of that. So what we're left with at the end of the day is approximately $6 million. And that's really to deal with the unforeseen pressures that we would have in 2022. Um, whether it's things like rising fuel prices or some of the inflationary pressures that we had not forecasted for the year. And then also looking forward to 2023 for any mitigations that we may require to put in place with respect to any lingering impacts that we would have on our budget with respect to COVID. So that's sort of the way it flows and sort of what you're left with at, at the end of the day. And I know that's a very long answer, my apologies. Um, but I think it's just important to have the context around that. Anything else, Councillor? Uh, final point, Mr. Mayor, and just point, looking for clarification. So, Wendy, when, when you say the $20 million parts of the tax stabilization piece make reference to the 13.6 for the respite centers, is that is what's in front of us is the 7.5 housing reserve? You're accounting for that 7.5 in that allocation to the of the 13.6. Is that what I'm? hearing sorry I just looking for clarification on where's that 7.5 ending up and my understanding of what you're describing is it's going to the respite report yeah the 7.5 is not going to the respite report it's actually going to the housing reserve so we've accounted for that in terms of the actual um uh I'm going to say uh deposits or the the credits that are going to the reserves so okay. it's not on top of it's included in Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McKenney, please. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, uh, Wendy, uh, for that uh, that um, detailed accounting of the uh, of the reserve accounts. And of course, uh, as the mayor pointed out, we are going into uh, an anomaly in terms of our budgeting for the first quarter due to the uh, the occupation coming out of you know COVID and and gaps that need to be filled. I just, uh, obviously most of my questions have, have been answered, um, but I just, uh, I, look at, I look at the employment and social services, uh, $6.4 million um, surplus. And, and I, I understand the, the bylaw is that that goes into, um, you know, general citywide reserve. But is there, is there any point, I mean, outside of, you know, a motion today or a motion to council to, you know, take that and 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 reallocate it back in as one time funding into uh, employment and social services. Is there any point as as you know as the books are being closed um, that that money can be taken and, and uh, you know and 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 address some of the uh, the needs in the community and I mean. Obviously, you know, $6.4 million one-time funding could go a long way to addressing a lot of the significant needs in, in our, our communities today. So I, I just, I guess I, what I'm looking for is just a path forward. If we were going to say, you know, take some of that and, and address some of the um, employment, social service, um, uh, needs in in our community is that the only um is that the only path forward to do that thanks councillor for the question um i'll start and and i'll just ask if my colleague uh, miss gray also wants to append to the answer in terms of I'm going to say putting that lens with respect to the needs of the community um where we stand right now uh the, you know, the, you have the disposition before you and the recommendations of staff. The piece that I think is a bit of an unknown for us, and I, the mayor spoke to this, um, is around what's going to happen in 2022. And that's the reason we have our tax stabilization reserve. It's, it's there 
um, to deal with, I'm going to say the pluses and the minuses, right, in terms of um, what we're having to face. And so we don't have a clear forecast in terms of what the impacts are going to look like for the city for 2022. We did our best in terms of tabling the budget as to what we thought some of those things would look like. We've got a bit of a shift in terms of Omicron um, coming, and I'm going to say this, this wave that's facing us now and, and how it might affect us. The other piece, um, while the federal government has made a commitment to cover the cost of the convoy, there may be some residual or additional things that are not covered that the city will have to absorb as a result of that. So there's just a couple of things that are really unknown at this point in time, um, where we don't have a clear picture as to where we're headed for 2022 outside of the budget forecast. And I'll just ask my colleague Donna if she has anything to add with respect to uh, the services. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Um, and the report that went forward to Community and Protective Services really was about addressing what we saw were the most urgent needs that we saw as gaps that were unfunded from now until the end of the year that we you know, were critical in the community to sustain um, the COVID response and to fill the gap. Up. So part of that 13.6 is to support community agencies that are supporting and providing both day programs and the supports around the um, uh, respite centers. We are still expecting social service relief funds. Um, we have been told that that money is coming and the intent would be to be again doing another assessment of those needs. And we have also received new reaching home funding, which will be providing um, reporting back to council on the spending plan for that reaching home funding, which we also believe will fill some of what we are seeing in the housing and homelessness sector in terms of the supports that we can provide. So at this point in time, you know, there isn't um, an identified gap that has come before us that we um, have not been able to fill, but we are anticipating should we get that social service relief fund that we would again canvas the organizations in the community to see where that gap is. Um, okay, and and that is expected in in the next short while, if I understand the uh, the SSRF is that correct? Yes, that's what we're hoping. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, I appreciate the uh, the response. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. Hope, hopefully, you're feeling better. Good, uh, Councillor El Shantiri. Uh, sorry, on the uh, report, I apologize, Terry. Yes. Uh, item you. nine: Comprehensive Asset Management uh, Program. Councillor El Shantiri had a question. Well, I do. Have, first of all, let me begin, Mr. Mayor, by thanking the staff for uh, for preparing this report. That they've done a great job. Uh, I've been communicating with staff, believe it or not, almost five or six meetings with uh, Jan Nelson, trying to wrap my mind. Up. And I know this is not for today or for next council meeting, for a future infrastructure. But we fall behind, Mr. Mayor time after time, and we get criticized quite a bit by the community because we are not keeping up with our infrastructure, even with our own reporting. And I don't want to go back to 2012, but some of you would remember we had an asset management report in 2012, and also we fell behind. And the reason we fall behind, not because our staff don't identify the project, what happened, Mr. Mayor, many times some of those projects comes back and with additional costs. Uh, I can give you a few examples, but I don't want to waste too much time on this. What I'm looking for, this report is go hand in hand with the long grunge financial plan. And the only way you can achieve this report, if we stick to the report, that every time we have a project, a local counselor or other have Oh, why don't we add this? Why don't we, we do this? Why don't we, uh, we, we do it this way? By doing it this way, that means other project is going to fall behind. And that's what we've seen happen in many times. And then we, the list will become behind. And then, you know, people in the community telling us, oh, your staff identified you should do this this year in 2024. And now you're 2026 and you're not even catching up. So what I'm looking for, whether today or between now and council, if we can tie the language, there should be no changes to the reporting or to the project without coming, 
if it's going to be major changes or 10% uh, increased changes. I'm not sure what the threshold number is. I'm hoping the staff can help me with this. It has to come back to council for approval because any project we do, whether Mackenzie Bridge, whether Elgin Street, whether Man Avenue, whatever we do, when we add cost to it, it's taken away from other projects and making other projects in other areas fall behind. And I can give you many examples, but I'm not going to waste too much of your time because I really want to focus how great this report is, identify the condition of city asset management. The question is, how can we have something in place to keep us moving forward with what's been in the report without tinkering with some of the project and, and create an increase in it? So I'm not sure if Tammy or Jen wants to comment now, or you want to take it away, talk to uh, uh, Wendy, our treasurer, about the long-range financial plan and how could we make sure the long range financial plan go hand in hand with this report and any changes or any fundamental changes or any change in the cost increases should come back for a full council because it's gonna affect all of us if one project take too much money so others gonna fall behind. So I'm at your hand, I'm not sure who's gonna pick it up. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to start off. Uh, we also have uh, my colleague, uh, Jen Nielsen, who's uh, also the main author as the uh, manager of asset management. We also have uh, Isabel Jasmine uh, on the line as well uh, to, to help. We're happy to take it back, Councillor. I think there's a, a number of mechanisms uh, that we have in place that help to, to mitigate. Uh, some scope changes and and as any project that that we have you know our capital planning certainly includes contingencies uh, in those so that there there are always an often unforeseen uh, needs uh, that come up so when we do a, a long range plan and and as our asset management plans go on uh, every year uh, we have an opportunity to refine that and make sure that the the scope is uh, is appropriate. So, um, and I think uh, on some other comments that you made, Councillor, uh, around um, our asset management um, implications. So part, part of our process that we're proposing to do for, uh, as we're looking at uh, transitioning to this new format and incorporating the long range financial plan in the future asset management plans, uh, we're also going to take a look at the existing reporting process that we have for all legislative reports that go to committee and council that has uh, a clause or a section that talks about asset management implications. So I understand you, you had some comments around, around policies and other decisions that councillors and council might make. So uh, we're looking to take a look at that process and see if there's any improvement so that, you know, going back to your, your comment around clarity and, and accountability, that some of those decisions decisions are, are maybe transparent on some financial uh, implications. Um, maybe, uh, Jen, is there anything else you, you'd like to add to the conversation? No, I think that covers it really well. Um, and I think in terms of timing, it would make sense to include that with the next round of asset management plans. So the target level of service in or by 2025 to consider um, something more formalized as part of that. And in the meantime, work towards formalizing how best to do that. Maybe uh, work with Councillor Elshantiri, who's raised this issue in the past um, for that report, if that could uh, take place, please. If I may, one more thing, Mr. Mayor, and you remember I came to your office with Steve Kay and, and other. One, one policy across the city does not serve us well, Mr. Mayor. Uh, they insist on a road design for Kinburn to be almost like any other street within the core of the city. They insist on having a hundred feet of sidewalk, which is this winter I have a challenge asking the neighbor to plow the sidewalk because I don't have a machine within 30 kilometers to do the sidewalk. They did a small bicycle line, which is false expectation because the, the, bicycle, the bicycle line is only hundred feet away in the main street of Kinburn, side road. And the rest of it is no bicycle line. The rest of it is no sidewalk. So that itself, uh, Ms. Rose, we need to look at it. The policy itself, one size does not fit all. We're telling you in the rural area, please 
spend your money and, and ask for and resurface it. Don't give me a hundred feet sidewalk and I have no machinery to, to plow it. The plow to come for the sidewalk has to be trailer almost 30 kilometers from March Road to come to Kinburn. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm, and I'm not sure who's going to be of us in the next term of council. But that itself, it needs to be revisited because that's fallen behind when you come to the long range financial plan. And then we get challenged by the community. You're not delivering on your own plan. And the reason for that, because of the policy and some of that changes during the project. Someone wants to perhaps uh, cover the, 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 the electricity, the wire, the, the utility should be underground. Well, if the project is, is, is costed and to have seconds. the wire over. No, but I mean, Mr. Mayor, those are important to, to, to be able to be included in this beautiful report, which is great asset management report, but I can tell you in a few years, somebody can challenge us about our own finding and say, you're not even following your own policy. And you're not catching up what you said you will catch up. That's what I'm trying to avoid that piece. If we can work together between now and council and bring some thought to it between the, Ms. Jasmine, Ms. Nelson, Ms. Rose, I'll be happy, Mr. Mayor, to do so. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you. <clears throat> On uh, the report, Carrie? Thank you. Thank you. Um, notice the motion for consideration of subsequent meeting. Any written inquiries, Madam Coordinator? Uh, other business, Councillor Dudas, uh, we've waved it on. So if you can introduce your motion, please. And I know Councillor King. Yes, certainly. Uh, whereas on December 19th, 2019, City Council approved, oh, there you go, approved an offer from Can numbered company candidate, the partnership to lease the Ottawa Stadium. And whereas a 10 year January 1st, 2021, to December 31st, 2031 lease agreement, was executed between the city and the partnership on September 22nd, 2020 for the use of the Ottawa Stadium. The lease included provisions for the city and the partnership to enjoy shared use of the facility. The lease agreement contemplated that the city would allocate to the partnership on a priority basis use of the stadium for league games and team practices. The agreement also contemplated that the city would be responsible for allocating all other baseball and non-baseball uses of the stadium, including partnership non-baseball events and all the community uses. The partnership has proposed that if it, is, if it assume responsibility for the scheduling, allocation, and booking of all facility uses by the partnership and community users, this approach would leverage the expertise of the partnership and the titans in managing and optimizing use of this purpose-built sporting facility for baseball operations and the delivery of special events. The partnership has also proposed to compensate the city for the budgeted revenue expected from its non-baseball events and community rentals in order to better coordinate use of the site and optimize its full potential. The city has assessed this proposal and concurs that it would be of benefit to all parties. Therefore, be resolved that FEDCO recommend that City Council approve the proposed changes in approach to the scheduling, allocation, booking of the site as proposed by the partnership and... Be it further resolved that the general manager of recreation, cultural and facility services be delegated the authority to finalize and execute a facility booking agreement with the partnership in accordance with the following guidelines. One, the partnership will allocate the use of the facility while ensuring that all clients booking the stadium have adequate insurance in place for the proposed use, including naming the city as an additional insured. The partnership will assume all responsibility for the setup, preparation, take down janitorial and any remedial work required for any special event day bookings. The partnership will continue to present Titans games in accordance with the requirements of its existing lease with the city. It will continue to prioritize bookings for community use that the partnership determines are appropriate and consistent with the caliber of the facility, including high level community leagues and post-secondary teams. The partnership will follow the requirements of the special events bylaw 2013-232, including consulting with the special events advisory team for any events where more than 500 people are expected to attend. It will continue to pay the fees that would otherwise be payable to the city for use of the facility as set out in the lease and to be reaffirmed in the facility booking agreement. The partnership will identify the city from any expenses, damages, losses, or claims arising from any bookings 
made by the partnership or the events held pursuant to a booking made by the partnership. And the facility booking agreement will only govern the transfer of responsibility for booking the facility from the central allocations office to the partnership and further delineate maintenance and repair obligations as a result of the different events. However, the existing lease agreement will remain in effect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, Councillor King, uh, since this is in your ward, I understand you've been briefed on this. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. And as a ward councillor, I'll be gratified to see the finalization and execution of a facilities booking agreement uh, with the Ottawa Titans Baseball Club. Under the proposed agreement, the team will assume responsibility for the scheduling, allocation, and booking of all facility uses. And the agreement will also further delineate the maintenance and repair obligations as a result of different events. So I'm, I'm ultimately happy to see the city uh, slowly return to normalcy with the return of baseball this spring uh, with the Titans home opener scheduled for uh, May 24th. This agreement will also streamline the process to maximize the use of the facility sooner rather than later by other organizations, including community organizations. As a consequence, I'm very gratified to support the motion, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, Councillor Dudas also for, for moving it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Leeper, please. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, sorry, this is a, a lot to, uh, to walk on. I do question the wisdom of, uh, of waving it on as a, a walk on rather than something that we deal with later. However, uh, just to help me wrap my mind around exactly what this would mean, can I just ask, we've had um, music festivals at the stadium. What would be the booking process now for a music festival to book the facility? Uh, and who would be responsible for making the decision as to whether or not they can? Uh, and is there any appeal should the team decide that an event is uh, not up to its caliber? Mr. Chenier? Uh, thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mayor. And thanks for the question, Councillor. Um, Currently, under the, the existing lease, the city would be responsible for booking um, any times, uh, any community use for festivals, for, for other types of events. Uh, and uh, for things like festivals, then of course, the, uh, the organizer, assuming that the event was going to be over 500 people, uh, would also have to go through the, uh, through the seat process for uh, having their event vetted. Uh, under the new process, uh, rather than booking through centralized, our centralized allocations, the group would now go to the Titans to, to book the stadium, but would still have to go to the special events review uh, to make sure that all city requirements for the event are being met. Are we not taking on a significant risk around the choices made to allow or not allow certain events at the facility? Uh, the, the types of events that this, this facility can, um, can accommodate are, are really pretty limited. We're talking about, for the most part, music concerts and uh, you know, performances of that nature, in addition to baseball. Uh, we are requiring the, uh, the Titans to ensure that uh, any, anybody who uses the stadium has insurance and that the city is a co-insured. Uh, the review of the type of events, the logistics, the safety plans, the traffic plans, all of those, all of those other things um, will still be subject to seat review and seat issuing the permits that they would issue as well. Um, and, and generally, even today, that is where uh, scrutiny of the type of event, the mitigating factors, uh, security, traffic, all those things, uh, that is really where those things would be reviewed and that will still happen. I wanna flip that around. Uh, my, my concern isn't necessarily that events that shouldn't be taking place at the stadium aren't moving ahead. I'm concerned about putting a private sector uh, entity in charge of deciding who gets use of the facility and who doesn't. If there's a, uh, a music festival that the Titans don't like, they would then have the ability to say, no, we're not going to book you the facility. Uh, is, there, is there some sort of an appeal mechanism or a way in which the city can override any of those decisions? 
Um, Councillor, I, I might remind members of the committee that when council approved the lease for this group, that a good part of the business plan and the intent was for them to leverage their significant experience in terms of being a promoter of non-baseball events uh, currently in Winnipeg um, to, to do that. And last year they, they demonstrated that. They, they certainly had escapade as, as a uh, initial run at, at doing this type of thing. Um, so, you know, the, the amount of use that this stadium has been, has had for other types of events have been fairly limited. And uh, I, I don't think there's any, any real danger that they're going to be denying clients. In fact, I think their business is, is their business challenge is really to attract clients. Um, currently, we haven't envisioned an appeal. Uh, ultimately, we are still the owners of the facility. And if there was a, a, a truly um, you know, flagrantly unjust situation, I expect that groups would likely still come to the city and we would try to negotiate a settlement that will, as, as landlord, uh, through Creo and, and through my department, uh, we, we, we are still in a close partnership with these folks and would certainly be able to, to have a discussion about those things. I don't foresee it as being an issue. I think they, they are happy to receive uh, any event that could try to animate that, that site. Sure. Uh, and then finally, how long uh, lease period are we looking at? Uh, the lease is a 10 year lease, which I believe is one year in. I, they, and so uh, I think we are looking at another nine, eight or nine years. I, I defer to Derek, who, who is the holder of the lease. Oh, uh, Mr. Moody could perhaps comment on. Yes, Mr. Mayor, the lease is a 10 year term. There are renewal terms. Um, on top of that, um, that will take it out to uh, beyond 2031. Okay. okay. Mayor, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Conseil Fleury, s'il vous plaît. Yes, Mr. Maire, and, and thank you. Yes, I, I want to speak in favor of uh, the motion as well. I did meet with uh, the Titans uh, over the fall, and I want to thank Dan. I know that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yourself and, and Councillor King were quite involved in the conversation. Baseball to survive in Ottawa needs that opportunity to diversify and create that experience. And I, I believe that the motion in front of us is just to allow the main leaser of our, our facility to really uh, present a fulsome experience at the stadium, uh, specifically when there are games, but also throughout the season. So um, they, they are... Uh, a, a very, very, um, very interested partner at the city. They want to make the baseball stadium work. They want to make baseball work in Ottawa. They have great experience from, um, I believe, from Winnipeg. They've shared a number of examples. And, you know, I, I, Dan, I would go even further that I think at some point we also need to look at how we do uh, les aménagements in the stadium. I know that that's I know that your team right now is looking at, from the facility point of view, just the basic upgrades of seating and so on, but they have really, really grand ideas to make sure that the caliber of the space uh, is modern and meets the needs of, of their programming. So uh, again, uh, Mr. Mayor, simply to speak in favor of, of the motion and want to commend the group uh, in uh, offering a, a diverse offering through the baseball experience. Great, thank you very much, Councillor Menard. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I just wanted to better understand on the process side of things. Um, it, is this a, a staff initiated change uh, that's occurring? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we received the proposal from the Titans uh, to, uh, to take this on uh, after the first season last year. Um, it it uh, became evident that having the city schedule community uses um, around Titan activities was um, perhaps a step that didn't need to be there. Uh, the stadium has um, a fairly standard roster of community users, um, which will be in the stadium this year with it, because this approval has not come forward yet, uh, has not been approved yet. Uh, the city has gone ahead and booked the community uh, community uses. The Titans have agreed to respect those and and to include them in the season. 
Um, but when we looked at it, it's simply trying to coordinate community use, Titan use, Titan practices, as well as events. Um, it made a lot of sense to have one party do it, do it all and be able to uh, optimize the use of the site, which is something that we will all benefit from. Uh, the Titans have offered to uh, make sure that the city financially is not impacted by this. So they will remit to us the budgeted equivalent of what we, what we would be receiving uh, from the community use of the facility. Okay. Okay, so just on just on pro sticking to process here, it, this is a bigger <laughs> decision, big deal. Uh, there's finance finances in, involved, uh, leases involved, um, booking of public space. Um, so, is there a report that's going to come forward to a committee to to discuss uh, the issue? Um, it seems odd to have this come as a as a motion. I, I'd like to see financials involved in it, uh, the booking of the space previously by community groups and what the city was bringing in, our costs, our cost avoidance. I mean, all those things are important. So is there a report coming forward to, to, to have a look at this or is this a motion and then it's just done where just all those details are to be determined? Uh, Mr. Mayor, there, there, there is no report. The intent was through today's motion to, to, to address the matter. As you noted at the beginning, uh, baseball season is about to start and event season is about to start. Uh, the financials that are involved in this matter uh, were all detailed in a report pr produced by our, our real estate uh, department uh, last year. Community use, budget of community use is a relatively minor. It's about $20,000 a year. Um, and, and the Titans, as I, as I mentioned, have uh, ensured us that they would make us whole in respect to not re uh, the city not receiving that revenue directly. Uh, so yes, to the, the motion before you is really to get a decision on this. It changes the model that was approved uh, in, in the initial report, but only from the perspective that um, the, the community use would go through the Titans rather than through the city. Yeah, I remember the initial report, uh, but this is a substantial cha substantial change, and I, and I just want to make sure we're not replicating this at a, a other a whole bunch of other public facilities that we've got. Uh, we've had proposals this year or this term for other um, public facility booking by the private sector, which doesn't always serve us well, as we've seen with many of the deals that have been signed. And so it's important that we've got full, like staff must have negotiated this, right? It's not uh, Councillor Dudas negotiating this with those teams. Um, it's, it, this is a discussion and negotiation by staff. There should be a full staff report for these sorts of items that come forward. I, I, this, there was no notice on a councillor's report. This is the type of thing that we need to see. And my concern is we, you know, we have public facilities, we own the facilities, we have the ability to book those facilities. And if we're seeing gaps in how we're booking them, um, then we need to address those, um, not just kind of farm it out to the private sector every time. And so, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about the precedents we set doing this over and over with our public spaces, because we've done it a lot now. Um, so, so I guess, in terms of no report coming forward, where, how are we to see the details of what, what funds are going to be coming our way, what the deal is? Uh, how is the public going to see the, 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 the financial uh, aspects of this uh, going forward in terms of the potential benefit or not for, for the city? Um, Mr. Mayor, the, the, as I mentioned, the, the motion outlines um, the revenue that will be coming to the city uh, the, that the Titans have offered to, to give us. That really is uh, the, um, the only change, which is the public use. All of the rest of the revenues, there's a share of the parking revenue, there's a potential share of the sponsorship revenue, were all outlined in the initial report and are still tied to the lease, which is still in effect. Um, the only part that is being um, altered by this motion is the community bookings. All of the rest, the other revenue streams that I just mentioned uh, are still 
uh, in place in accordance with the lease, which was subject to the council report. Okay. And is it, is it uh, the the bookings through um, the Titans proper as a as the uh, the partnership entity here? It says that's the in the motion. It just says the partnership is that it, or is it the Winnipeg ownership group and and OSEG, which owns the the team uh, in this case? Like just in terms of process, it is the partnership entity, which is primarily the Titans. They have the uh, the on site booking capability to uh, and, and the, uh, the group to organize events. Uh, and so they do have uh, local representation here and an office uh, at the stadium. Okay, I just, I'll just suggest Mayor um, that, that these sorts of items come in proper reports. If we've got staff negotiating, if there's changes to previous deals we've signed, uh, these things should come in, in a proper report to council um, in this case when we're talking about that kind of public use community booking uh, with the private sector, it, it shouldn't come as a, as a walk on motion in, in this case. So uh, process wise, I'd like to avoid that in the future so we can all have the information. It can be public. People can comment on it. And, you know, we get community groups that may want to want to talk about it. So I would suggest that in terms of process uh, in the future. Thanks. Uh, anyone else wish to speak before Councillor Dudas wraps? Councillor Dudas? necessarily have a wrap. I do have some questions for Dan, though, and I, I think he has actually addressed uh, some of the questions I had, which is to re reiterate the fact that this came before us almost a year ago as a fulsome report, and that my understanding, and Dan, please correct me if I'm wrong, that this does not change the lease, which you said a moment ago, and I'm reiterating again, that the fact is the changes to the community bookings aspect of it. Now, my question to you, Dan, though, is that this is a very specific purpose-built facility, and in terms of programming it by the city or by the community, does this relationship with the Titans make it easier to utilize this space, which is truly built for sports in terms of baseball? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, we, we believe that uh, because the Titans are uh, now a local entity interested in supporting baseball and promoting baseball, uh, that this will generate more appropriate use of the stadium. Uh, at one time, there was a notion that minor league could use this facility or that um, you know there, there could be a whole variety of different uses. The reality has been stated as this really is a purpose-built facility for a certain caliber of baseball um, that, that can make use of that size of a facility. Um, through their network and through developing local baseball, we think we will see more um, higher level cap capacity baseball used for at that, at that site, both in terms of games and in terms of practices, training, perhaps even baseball events. Um, so we think the Titans bring something that uh, doesn't exist there today. Okay. And I, I just, you know, I'm going back to more than a year ago now when we had wonderful conversations with Councillor King, whose board this falls into, and Councillor Fleury in his role as sports commissioner um, in respect to the community engagement and involvement in this facility. Um, that's something that hasn't been, uh, it's been lacking in the past in access to this. Can you just uh, once again speak to, and, and maybe feel free to elaborate on the community's ability to book this facility going forward and what the city will do to ensure that they have access to it, um, even if the Titans are managing that kind of community booking aspect? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it is the intent through the, the agreement we will sign with the Titans to include a, 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 a provision for open community access to this facility. Um, there are a, a variety of community festivals and events that may want to make use of this, of this site. Um, it does have um, you know, its own specific peculiarities in terms of what it can offer, uh, but uh, groups have um, shown an interest in doing that. Uh, we think some of the, you know, some of the real potential are for outdoor events, concerts, and those kinds of things. And the Titans certainly intend to, to look at expanding what's been offered there. 
but there may be a more local use of both the stadium and the parking lot. The parking lot has been shown to be a good uh, area for smaller fairs and circuses and those kinds of attractions. And certainly the intent is to keep that place busy and the, the, you know, the Titans have really made a commitment to try to make this a, um, a go-to location for all kinds of events. And uh, uh, we believe they bring the expertise to, to, to the task. Thank you, Dan. And I want to thank all the staff for their hard work on this motion and the report that came last year, which council supported. I mean, I think it's important that we animate this space. We animate it with baseball, which it's meant to do, and which we've seen previous teams struggle uh, to maintain their, their uh, operations there. So I'm hoping the Titans are very successful. I want to continue to go and see baseball at this wonderful facility in East End. But we also want to see better use of the, the Evrons around it, the parking lot, the spaces within for community purposes. And to me, it sounds like as if this small tweaking of what is a report that we agreed on a year ago will actually put it on the Titans to make sure that this is a viable space for the community or their baseball league, and that the city will be able to continue to monitor whether that is act, they're proactively reaching and working with the community and the ward councillor to ensure that that happens, as well as the city. So I hope that everyone can support this motion. And once again, I look forward to seeing the first pitch go out. Although I'll tell you, I did try to throw a first pitch and it did not go well. So I do hope to see baseball return to this stadium, and I hope to see it very soon. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Dudas. And uh, I too will be supporting the report uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I think uh, for the first time in a long time, uh, this team that has uh, deep uh, baseball roots in Western Canada is going to bring that expertise uh, to Ottawa, coupled with the LRT uh, station at Tremblay. People can come from uh, downtown or the East End, uh, hop off at Tremblay, go across the Max Keeping Bridge, and there you are right at the baseball stadium. And the incentive is there in the private sector to actually go out and get events to be held at the baseball stadium. Uh, no disrespect to the public servants, but it was not their business of going out and hustling to get business because there was nothing added to the bottom line. There's a financial incentive if um, more events take place at the stadium for both the team as well as for the city of Ottawa. So I think it's a win-win situation. Um, you know, we've been through uh, lots of ups and downs when it comes to baseball in this city. I feel much more optimistic with um, the ownership group, uh, with uh, both um, Western Canadian ties and local ties here in Ottawa. Uh, and uh, my hope is that the, uh, the, the access uh, via transit is going to make it very convenient for people in many parts of the city uh, to go and enjoy a great baseball game. And I thank Councillor King for his support uh, of this um, initiative because, um, you know, a lot of the community events, I assume and hope, will come from the Overbrook Forbes community uh, using that facility to bring people together. So uh, on the report, carried, adopté, merci. Very good. Uh, motion to adjourn, carried. Our next meeting is May 3rd, la prochaine réunion, c'est le 3 mai 2022. Uh, merci, meeting adjourned. <laughs>